I remember standing on stage and just feeling this massive connection with the audience. So far away Touched by the kiss of love I'm Sam Brown. I'm a writer and a musician. Um, my dad was an, a 1960s pop star uh, known as Cheeky Chappy Joey Brown. Lots of people named their budgies after him. And my mum, she started out in a dancing troupe from Liverpool, but then she went on to do backing vocals for T-Rex, Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel people. She just sang with everyone. She's really well known uh, as being one of the top session singers in the country. And we used to go and do backing vocal sessions together. I started to write songs when I was about 12, I think, 12 or 13. And I just loved it. I, lo I played piano, I loved writing, and that just became my passion. And after that, singing and writing, nothing else touched the sides. I basically just stayed at home all day and wrote or I was out doing session work and I worked with Dexy's Midnight Runners. Spandau Ballet was my first tour. I'd never toured before when I was 19, so that was good fun. And they had a number one hit at the time. I also sang with Elton John, uh, later on George Harrison. I wrote songs and sang with John Lord from Deep Purple again a bit later on. So I eventually signed a record deal with A&M Records and I wrote my first album, which was called Stop. And that, very fortunately for me, and through the wondrous work of uh, the marketing chap called Rudy in Holland, uh, went to number one in Holland. And it just snowballed from there, really. It went from Holland to Belgium to Germany, then France and Spain picked it up. Strangely enough, England was the last place. So that was stop, and that took me around the world for three years doing PR, talking to lots of different people, doing photo sessions, generally having a great time, but not doing any music. So I then started writing my second album, and I also started work with Jules Holland, and I really loved it because it was, it took all the pressure away from singing. It wasn't like I was up there being the focus of attention. I was part of a fantastic big band. Everyone was so lovely to me. Something to do with my tits, I think, possibly. But I could be wrong, I could be wrong. So basically, I worked with Jules and I continued to write and record albums. So there was Stop, then I did April Moon. Um, then my third album was 43 Minutes, which I wrote around the death of my mum. My mum died of cancer. And obviously that was a very difficult time. But it was good in some ways because it made me come back to myself creatively. And I just thought, I, you know, life's short as I was being very dramatically you know, made aware of at the time. And so my third album, I really wrote exactly what I wanted to write. And it was very much an expression of what I was going through at the time. So that was uh, a turning point, I think, for me, because it made me realise that, I mean, I, I was never ambitious and I've never bothered about being famous, but commercial success, certainly for me at that time, had very little to do with music. And as my ex-managing director said to me from a and Records, creatively it's brilliant, commercially it's a disaster. So I call that the height of my commercial decline if that makes any sense whatsoever. So after 43 minutes, I then toured with Pink Floyd. That was when I did the tour with Pink Floyd. I actually worked with David Gilmour first, and then I think I turned three Pink Floyd tours down before I ended up doing the one that I did in 1994. So that was amazing. I really loved doing that. I 
took my daughter Vicky with me, she was six months old, and I started writing my fourth album when I was on the road with Pink Floyd, which was Box. I think my marriage had just started falling apart at that point. You know, I do wonder how other people manage without having the outlet of being able to write all this into music. Because <laughs> of course I could get up on stage and scream and shout about it all, you know, and that was okay. And then Reboot was my fifth album. Then we had Of The Moment, and then I released an album about a year ago, I think, and it was my one-woman show, and that's called Wednesday the Something of April. Oh my love, I, have tried. I then sang with Jules Holland and toured with him for, well, across about 15 years, actually, Then also doing a one-woman show. It basically felt like my singing career was probably the best it could be. I loved it. I loved singing. I felt like I was flying when I was singing on stage. I really felt the singing with Jules was where I was meant to be. But in the midst of all this wonderfulness, I found on a particular night that I was unable to hit the notes. And I then became aware of having to push up to the notes. So I, I couldn't just think a note. And I mean, in fact, I didn't think about singing at all. It, it was just there, it just came out. It was so second nature to me. Um, but I just couldn't sing in tune. And I tried to get around it. I tried moving my voice around it. I tried singing in different ways. And I had an operation to remove some polyps on my vocal cords, but that, that wasn't the issue. I don't think I'll ever come to terms with not being able to sing the way I used to sing. I think I was very fortunate to have the kind of instrument that I had. And all our dreams come tumbling down all For me, it's taken me a very long time to get over it. And I think there's still a sort of sub layer of depression that's constantly there and I have to work quite hard at enjoying my life, enjoying things and finding joy in things because nothing will ever come close to the joy that I felt when I sang. I and that made me really just not want to play or, or do any music at all and that just took me on a completely different path, took my whole life on a different path. I had to find a different way to make a living. I had two children, I was on my own with two children. So it really was a complete game changer for everything. It, it took me down a fantastic path actually because I went on to teach ukulele and meet some amazing people. Um, but I still really just wanted to sing again. <laughs> I've really lost my creative self, stopped playing anything, stopped writing, up until lockdown. So, uh, like probably so many other people, I just found myself with a very changed life, with more space and more time. And I got in touch with my friend Danny Shogger. Danny is a very nice bloke from North London. He's a fantastic piano player. He's a record producer. He produced Celine Dion. He produced Jimmy Nail. He's also a writer. I've always written with him. And he said, well, you know, we, we could try a bit of writing, couldn't we? And uh, so I said, yeah, all right then. So we decided to write every Tuesday. Um, and we just ended up writing an album. The album's called Number Eight because it's my eighth album. <laughs> It's uh, a joyous experimentation of synthetic sounds and Samantha's synthetic voice. Another thing that's really come through is everything about the album is fake. Uh, the voice is tuned, 
uh, the harmonies are tuned, all the keyboards are synthetic and chopped about. Um, so to me, the whole thing is the polar opposite of everything that I used to be about. I'm completely overjoyed to have discovered that I can still really love doing music without my voice. I am not injured, I do not cry, I am not broken, I will not.